next Monday at 6.30. Um, you're going to need a Bible, and you can grab it and turn to Philippians chapter 2 is the primary text that will be in this morning. And so we are in week two of our little mini-series uh, on marriage. And so last week, um, we really, the big idea was we were looking at the, the differences between the culture's view of marriage and love and romance and the biblical view. And I, and I hope you realize that it's, it's massively different. Um, by and large, our culture's view of love and romance and marriage, we have this kind of apocalyptic, romantic, you know, the butterfly feelings, you know, the, the romantic comedies, that kind of view of love. And yet also then our culture views marriage as, well, my spouse, their job is to fulfill me, right? My spouse's job is to make me happy and to fulfill me. And, and if that's not happening, then I'm just going to break the contract and get out of it and find someone that does do that, and then we saw that the biblical view of marriage is this idea of covenant, right? And we, we looked at the Hebrew word dabak, right? Covenant, which is this idea of an unbreakable promise, and it's a it's a it's a relationship where it's a sacrificial commitment to the good of the other. So notice that it's almost opposite. The Bible's view of marriage is how can I sacrifice for my spouse? And our culture's view of marriage is, you should sacrifice for me. And so I, I think the reason we talked about that is that it lays a lot of groundwork for why conflict and hard times come. Because I think lots of times we have bought into the culture's view of marriage. And then hard times come and we go, well, you're not making me happy. And, and so then it just compounds it over and over. So... Today, and I joked with the worship team before we start, today we're going to talk about how all of you are selfish and self-centered. So welcome to North of East MV Church. I, I think that one of the biggest issues in our marriages is that every human being is self-centered. Um, Martin Luther, he actually called this homo incurvatus, which basically means human beings turned in on themselves. Right? Man turned in just gazing at himself. This is what Martin Luther said, you know, 500 years ago. Our nature, by the corruption of the first sin, being so deeply curved in on itself. Did my microphone just die? Someone's muting me. Hello? <laughs> Checking. <laughs> Checking one, two. It's not muted here. Checking one, two. You can hear me. It says full battery. <laughs> Those watching online are just seeing my mouth move going, what is happening? <laughs> Do you want me to just grab a different mic or? Okay, we'll keep going here. So let me start that quote over again. Martin Luther. Our nature, by the corruption of the first sin, being so deeply curved in on itself, that it not only bends the best gifts of God towards itself and enjoys them, or rather even uses God himself in, an, in order to attain these gifts, but it also fails to realize that it so wickedly, curvedly, and viciously seeks all things, even God for its own sake. So Martin Luther says that our nature, because of sin, it's just curved in on itself. We take all the good things that God gives us, and we enjoy them, but it's all about me. Right? And so I, I really do believe that 99%, if not 100%, of marital conflict, disagreements, hard times, are caused by self-centeredness. That I am just gazing at my self that I want my way, I want things to work out in my favor, favor. And so today we want to talk about how do we actually combat this? So Paul wrote the book of Philippians to a church in Philippi that was dealing with a massive amount of conflict. Dealing with just so many issues of 
our passage is not necessarily dealing specifically with marital conflict, but all the principles that the book of Philippians lays out for us is so applicable to marriage. So here's, here's what it, it means. If you are married, this applies to you. Now, if you're here and you're single, don't just go on Instagram now and just be like, well, uh, merit doesn't apply to me. Listen, if you are a follower of Jesus and you know another follower of Jesus, this passage applies to you. Because just because you're not married doesn't mean you're not self-centered. We all are. So we want to look through uh, Philippians chapter 2, the first 11 verses, and so kind of draw out some applications specifically for marriage. So verses 1 and 2, this is what Paul says. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. So Paul is beginning this section with a rhetorical question, right? If. Now he's not... When he uses that word if, so if there are these things, he's not saying that there's any doubt that there is. He's not going, we don't know if, if or if not. The way it's worded is that it's presented as, of course these things are true, right? So if there is any encouragement in Christ, right, as followers of Jesus, if there's any encouragement in Jesus, which we would all go, of course there is. If there's any comfort from love, and we would all go, yes, love is very comforting. The love of God towards us comforts us. The love that we have for one another, that comforts us. He says if there's any participation in the Spirit, right, if we're participating one uh, to another in the Spirit, if there's any affection and sympathy between us. So, right, Paul's assuming all of these things are true. There is affection. There is sympathy. There is love. So if those things are true, which they are, then verse 2, Paul says, then, then do these things. Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. So on the basis of those truths, the encouragement, the love, the spirit, affection, and sympathy— because of those things, if those things are true, then have this unity among yourselves. Be of the same mind, the same love, one in spirit, one in purpose. Now, in verse 3, Paul's now going to say, now don't do these things, right? Verse 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. So Paul says, don't do anything from these two, coming out of these two things, selfish ambition or conceit. The word selfish ambition, some of your translations might say rivalry. And the Greek word is erethean, and it literally means self-interest or acting for one's own gain regardless of the issues or the discord that happens. Right, so it, rivalry, selfish ambition literally means I am going to do anything I want that helps my cause regardless of how it affects anyone. Right, that's what Paul's saying. Do nothing out of that. Now, the reason he says that is that in Galatians 5, Paul lists rivalry or selfish ambition as one of the works of the flesh. So what he means by that, in Galatians 5, Paul compares, here's the works of the flesh, here's the works of the spirit. So the natural person, unregenerated by God, just how we naturally are, Galatians 5 says this, the works of the flesh are evident. Here they are. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, there's our word. Selfish ambition, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgy, and things like these. I warn as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So Paul says, here are all the evidences of someone who doesn't know God. Someone who doesn't walk with the Spirit. And rivalry, selfish ambition is in there. So think about that. You being self-centered and wanting your own way is an evident... Evidence that you're not walking with the Spirit. 
Now, the second word Paul uses is conceit. Do nothing from rivalry, selfish ambition, or conceit. And that, that word literally means vain glory. Empty pride is what it means. It's a state of pride that has no basis or justification. Ready, good? I hate holding microphones. Oh, praise the Lord. I can use my hands. Thank you, team. Woo! Way to go. Way to figure it out. So, con- uh, conceit, nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. It's vain glory. It's empty pride. It's a state of pride that really has no basis. So it's not like, you know, the top-rated Olympic swimmer being prideful that they won gold. It's me thinking that I'm the greatest swimmer in the world. It's empty pride. It it just makes no sense. It's going, you're not even good at swimming. Why do you think you're so great? That's what conceit is. And it comes from the belief that I'm actually due more than I've received. Right? The love that I've received, that the praise that I've received, I am due more than what I'm what I'm getting. And I'm worthy of more honor that I'm that I'm getting. So Paul says, right, he's speaking to believers, don't do anything. Out of those two things. Don't do anything from selfish ambition, from wanting to be first and best, or from conceit, thinking that I am better than other people. Here's how this, here's how this plays out. Rivalry or selfish ambition, is, it, it manifests itself like this. I have to beat them. I have to be better than them. I have to keep a record of my wins and my losses, just so I know that I'm better than them. And conceit is then being a sore loser when I don't beat them, and I need to save face, and I need to keep up appearances. I'm describing some of your marriages. I gotta be, I, I'm, I'm ahead now. You owe me, right? I did this, this, and this, and you only did this. You owe me now, right? That's selfish ambition and conceit rearing its ugly head. So Paul says, don't do do anything out of those places. But here's the the opposite, second half of verse 3. But in humility, count others more significant than yourself. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Right? So here's the opposite. In humility, consider other people as more significant than you. Now, we've talked about humility recently, and and humility is just a proper view of yourself. It's a proper estimation, right? Conceit, false pride, empty glory is a wrong view of yourself. You think you're worth more than you are. Humility is an accurate view of yourself, right? It's an accurate view. I know who God is. I know who I am. It's, It's accurate based on scripture. And so, the, 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 the phrase then, in humility, count others more significant. It literally means hold other people above yourself. View them as superior to you. Now, you're probably saying the same thing I said. Do you realize how hard this is? <laughs> to hold someone else above me, it's hard. To view other people, to view your spouse, to view other people in the church as more significant than yourself, that's hard to do. Right? We're going to get into some, uh, some examples for marriage, but to come to church and, and say, I hope that we sing more choruses than hymns because I know the younger people love that. Or opposite, to come as a young person and say, man, I hope we sing some hymns today because I love it when my grandma just sings out. That is viewing someone as better than you. Not saying, I didn't like worship today because we didn't sing the songs I liked. Selfish ambition and conceit. That's what Paul's saying. He's like, don't do stuff like that. Now, humility, this comes from humility. To be able to actually... Count other people as more significant than you and, and look to other people's interests. It comes from a place of, of humility. Now, it, Paul's talking about true humility. He's not talking about false modesty. 
or, you know, just timidness. And so I'll give you an example of false modesty. Um, when our kids were a little bit younger, our two girls, we watched Winnie the Pooh a lot. And my least favorite character is Eeyore. He is so annoying. Because he, is, he, he has false modesty. It's fine. Thanks for noticing. No one cares. Woe is me. You're better than me. There was one episode that I remember that, if you remember the great windstorm, right? An owl's tree, his house falls on Eeyore's house, and Eeyore's like, it's fine, whatever. No one cares about me. I'll go build my little stick house over here, right? That's not humility. No one, no one watching that goes, wow, Eeyore is so humble, we all go, oh, I hate Eeyore. Sorry if he's your favorite <laughs> character. But that's not humility. Just going, it's fine, whatever. My needs don't matter. That's not humility. That is false modesty. So Paul's not saying that we come in and it doesn't matter. You decide. That's not humility. Humility is just knowing I know who I am. In light of Jesus, I know who I am. I don't, I don't have to get my own way. I'm fine with that. Right? And then Paul says, look not only to your own interests, but look to the interests of others. We are really, really good. It's, it comes naturally to us to look out for our own interests. Everyone naturally, naturally looks out for themselves. And so what Paul is saying is take that same level of care and concern that you have for your, yourself and apply it to someone else. Right? So notice that he doesn't say, well, don't look to your own interests. No, he says, no, don't look only to your own interests, but look to the interests of others. Take the same care that you give yourself and give it to other people. So like I said, the whole book of Philippians is great. It speaks specifically to a church in conflict, but I think these, these principles apply so well to our marriage relationships. I think, like I said at the beginning, a huge issue in marriage is our self-centeredness. We are preoccupied with ourselves. And many times we live in our marriages with selfish ambition and pride. And we live with rivalry and conceit because I, if you're honest, you think that you are better than your spouse. That you go, my needs matter more. I want my way. I want my interests looked after. Now, here's why this is such a battle, because you are told in our culture that you are number one. You are told in your culture, just take care of yourself. You are told in our culture, you are the most important person in the world. Love yourself, right? We live in a world that is just radically individualized and we are obsessed with the idea of self-esteem. I just have to build myself up. There's a great book called The Narcissism Epidemic. It was written like 13 years ago and uh, it, it studied the United States and this rise of narcissism. People just obsessed with themselves and, and they kind of got into, well, here's some reasons why. So here's an, an NBC ad, right? The big uh, television network, the NBC. This is an ad that they ran, ran. They said, you may not realize it, but everyone is born with their one true love, themselves. If you like you, everyone else will too. Right? So that's on TV and I'm watching. I'm like, oh, I'm my own one true love. If I just like myself, then everyone else will like me too, if you did a Google search, and, and granted, this was 13 years ago, so it's probably even higher, but in 2009, if you did a Google search, how to love yourself, there was 191,000 pages that came up with things like this. Make a note every time someone says something nice about you. Just carry around a little journal, and when someone's like, hey, your beard looks great today, <laughs> May 1st, 2022, Tyler Giesbrecht complimented <laughs> my beard. <laughs> well, that's, that was a suggestion. So then you can go back and look through at all the nice things that people said about you. Stop all criticism of yourself. That was one, uh, one um, uh, suggestion. Look at yourself in the mirror every day and say, you look great. Uh, in the book, it talks about a preschool that every day they sang this song when the kids came in. The kids all sang this, I am special, I am special, look at me. And it was great. One dad responded to that saying, I think you should sing this. I promise to listen to my dad and stop kicking him in the face when he tries to dress me. 
you said. That's probably a more accurate song that these preschoolers should be singing. So, yeah, this is our world, right? Our world just caters to our individuality saying, oh, you are so special. You are so great. You are number one. Look out for yourself. So you take two people swimming in that culture, and then they get married. And they go, well, this marriage clearly should be about me. Because our world says that I'm the most important person. And so a man and a woman get married, believing that their needs are more significant. Selfish ambition and and vain glory. Rivalry and conceit. I need to win these arguments. I need to have my needs met. My wants and my needs outweigh my spouses. They aren't as important as I am. And then to actually put my spouse's need ahead of my own, that's why it can feel unnatural sometimes. It can feel like we're swimming upstream because the world says the exact opposite. So what would this look like? What would it look like for spouses? We're specifically going to get into some marriage examples. What would it look like for spouses in humility to count the other person more significant than themselves? What would it look like, husbands, for you to count your wives as more significant than you are? What would it look, wives, for you to count your husbands as more significant than yourself? What would this look like? So I remember when, um, when we just had our two girls, uh, and they were born just under two years apart. So there was a season there where we had two little toddlers very close together. And uh, it was just mayhem, right? And some of you are like, I have eight kids. Try that. And I'm like, I get it, okay? But for us, for, with two kids, it was just mayhem. And I, I remember specifically one day I came home from work and I came inside. And our house, it looked like a tornado had gone through our house and then had come back again <laughs> in every room. And I remember I came home, and I was, I was quite uh, upset, right? I had a, a long day of work dealing with people and blah, 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 blah. And I came home, and, and it just kind of put me in a bad mood, just like, ugh. And, and I had these thoughts in my head. What does Molly do all day? I know. I told Molly, I'm using examples, but they all make me look bad, so don't worry. But I thought that. I said, what does she do all day? Like, every room is just a mess, and then I'm just grumpy, and, and I remember l- later on, M- Molly, obviously, because she's smart, could, could sense that something, hey, what's wrong? And I just said, um, well, I came home, and just the house was a mess, and it just, like, it just really bummed me out, and, you know, I think you should work harder, <laughs> whatever I said. I don't remember. But here's, here's what I didn't do when I came home. I didn't consider Molly as more significant than myself. I didn't, I didn't even ask how her day was. I just came in grumpy saying, well, here's my expectations, and obviously Molly's disrespecting me because the house is messy. And she said, do you want to hear the kind of day I had? Right? Kids running around accidents as we're potty training all over the floor, just on and on and on. And yet I came in and I considered myself more significant than her. Didn't even ask how her day had been. Right? What would it look like if I had come home and just considered her needs as more significant than my own? And selfish ambition then keeps a record Right? Selfish ambition, what Paul says, don't live like this. Selfish ambition then keeps a record where I go, that's four, four nights this week that I came home in the house or whatever, right? Selfish ambition then is I'm going to start keeping a record of, of ways that I feel wronged. Humility serves your spouse, right? Not expecting anything in return. A, a humble thing for me to do, to consider my spouse as more important than myself, would, would to be come home and, first of all, just ask how her day was. What went good? What went r- wrong? And then to go, you know what? Uh, let me clean up. Why don't, you, why don't you go to Starbucks for a little bit and have a break? That would be considering someone is more significant than me. Even Romans 12, I love what Paul says. He says, let love be genuine 
Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, and this is so key, outdo one another in showing honor. Right? What, what would that look like if it said, you know what, not only do I want to consider my spouse as better than me, I actually want to outdo them in showing honor. Now, you want to know how twisted we are? We'll do that, and then we'll make it a competition to see, see, I out, I see, I showed you honor this many times, and you, you showed me honor this many times. Like, we're so, we're so self-centered that we even take something good like that, and we make it about ourselves. What would it look like to, to not only look to your own interests, right, verse 4, but to the interests of others? What, what, would that, what would that actually look like? Because like I said, everyone, we all naturally look to our own interests, but what would it look like if every day I said, I'm going to actually look to the interests of my spouse? So I'll give you another example. Um, again, early on with um, two young kids and, and married people with children will know this, uh, it can be difficult sometimes to be intimate because there's always kids everywhere. And you're like, I just want some like intimate physical time with my spouse. And so I remember early on, um, oh, I'm going to embarrass myself anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> it had been a while. And my, some of you, too much information, but so be it. And my wife, I remember in the morning as I was heading to the church, she kind of observed that. Hey, it's been a while tonight, right? Let's, let's be intimate tonight. So my day was ruined because the whole day, <laughs> as a man, that's all you think about. And I remember going home and helping out with dinner. And I said, you know what? I will put the girls to bed, right? I will do whatever I can. And I put the girls to bed, and there was Barry White music playing in my head. And so I got the girls to bed, and I went into our bedroom, and my wife was fast asleep. Because she's a, she's a mom of two toddlers. And everything in me wanted to, hey, do you remember? Because I'm looking out for my own interests. Do you remember what you said this morning? So looking to the interests of my spouse would mean my wife is exhausted. I need to let her sleep. And I'm going to go take a cold shower. <laughs> but that's what it looks like. There's an example of me saying, like, everything in me said, no, Andrew, you deserve this. Your wife said this. You, you need this. Look to your own interests. But, but looking to the interests of your spouse says, you're exhausted. You need to sleep. And I mean, we could go on and on and on of example after example of ways that you do this, but it, we often think, here's one of the problems, we often think, well, if my spouse did this, then I would do it back in return, right? We, we think like that. If my spouse put my needs first, then I would be able to put their needs first, right? It's almost like my spouse needs to make the first move, and, and then I can kind of reciprocate it, but that's not what we're called to, right? Paul doesn't say, count others more significant than yourselves if they do the same thing. That's not what he says. Even if it's not reciprocated, Paul says, do these things. Now, we need to go on a little bit of a rabbit trail here, and I'm going to speak to men specifically. Men, I believe that Scripture calls you to actually lead the way in this for a couple of reasons. If you look at Ephesians 5, speaking to husbands and wives, Paul starts by saying, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. And many husbands stop reading there and they go, that sounds pretty good. I'm the boss. I make the decisions. Oh, oh, brothers, keep, keep reading. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. 
that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we're members of his body. So Paul says, husbands, men, your job is to love your wives like Jesus loved the church. And how did he love the church? He died for her. So men, when you read Ephesians 5 and you go, this is great, I'm in charge, I'm the boss. You have read it incorrectly. Your job is to die. And the reason I say that men, I think we take the first step in this is because in the relationship between Jesus and the church, who initiated it? Jesus. We've looked through the gospel of John over and over and over again. No one can come to the Father unless the Son draws him. Jesus is the one that initiates in the relationship between the church and him. And I think, likewise, men, your job is to put your lives on the line for your wife. 1 Peter 3 actually even says, men, if you don't show honor to your wives, your prayers are hindered. Do you realize that, men, the weight of that? If you walk around as the king of your castle and you don't honor your wife, God says, don't bother praying. I'm not listening to you. Now, that doesn't mean wives are off the hook. <laughs> wives, you're, you're called to do this too. You are called to, to put your husband, his needs above your own. But it seems to me that husbands, there, there's a weight there that you are the one that initiates this. You lay your lives down. You sacrifice for your wife. You put her needs first so that your wife flourishes. If you think you're doing Ephesians 5 well and your wife isn't flourishing, you're not doing it well. Now, here's, here's the encouraging part. We're not left to ourselves because we're given the example of Jesus. I know it could feel so overwhelming. You're like, my goodness. I have to think of someone, my spouse is more significant than me. I have to lay my, my preferences down. But th this is what Paul goes on to say in verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So Paul says, here's the example. You want to know what it looks like to, in humility, count others as more significant than yourselves, to look not only to your own interests, but, but to the interests of others? Do you want to know what that looks like? Look to Jesus. The example is him. He modeled this for us. In humility, Jesus came. And Jesus considered us as more significant than himself. If you read the Gospels, Jesus constantly put others' needs ahead of his own. He didn't, Paul says he didn't even think that the fact that he was God, something that he was going to use to his own advantage, but he, Jesus made himself nothing. He was obedient to the cross. And as you read the passion narrative in the Gospels, even till the moment he breathed his last breath, Jesus put others ahead of himself. He washes his disciples' feet. Even Judas, the betrayer, the one that stabbed him in the back, he washes his feet. As Jesus hangs on the cross, he, he makes arrangements for his mom to be taken care of. Like in the most pain and agony a human being can be in, he's taking care of his mother. Jesus encourages the thief hanging next to him. When, when Jesus is arrested and, 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 and the, the high priest's servant's ear is cut off, Jesus takes care of him. He heals his, his ear. Jesus constantly thought of others. 
And as followers of Jesus, that's our example. We want to be like him, and sanctification is is the Holy Spirit changing us more and more into the image of Jesus. And so our response then is, I want to treat my spouse how Jesus treated people. I want to sacrifice for my spouse how Jesus sacrificed his very life for people. I want to look to the interests of my spouse uh, how Jesus looked to the interest of others. Arguments and conflicts escalate in marriage when you and I want to be right more than we want to be like Christ. And I'll say this, the, usually the one who wins the argument is the one who acted less like Jesus. And so every marriage goes through arguments and conflict, but what matters most, winning arguments or looking like Jesus? Jesus. Now, I know that it feels overwhelming because you look at the example of Jesus and some of you look at your own marriages and you go, man, I've got a long way to go. I'm so selfish. I constantly put my needs first. I don't look to the interests of my husband or wife. And I just, we're just constantly in conflict with each other because we both want to be right. It just seems impossible. So a couple of things. First off, Jesus loves failures. That's why he came. This is who Jesus surrounded himself with. That's that's who he died for. And so if you're sitting here going, man, I feel like a failure, join the club. All of us fail. And that is exactly why Jesus came. And secondly... I believe that you can actually do this. On one hand, most of us did this while dating. We just got lazy. If I think about when I was dating Molly, I constantly thought, how can I put her needs ahead of my own? How can I, how can I do things to, to help her flourish and love dating me? So don't say that, oh, it's impossible. We all did it while dating. And then you just get married, and, and I'm there too. You just, you just get lazy sometimes. And I think you can actually do this because verse 5 says, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now, the word mind, it means your understanding, and it actually comes from the, the root word diaphragm. Which you go, that's odd. But it comes from the parts that are around your heart. And the word mind or understanding, it means two things. It means your visceral mind, which, which is a, w- a way to say your deep inward feelings. And it means your cognitive mind, which is your conscious intellectual activity, your thinking, your decision making. So Paul says, listen, you, you have this mind in Jesus. You have the ability to have deep inward feelings and you have the ability to make conscious decisions for the good of others. You have this mind. If you're a follower of Jesus, you've been given this mind in Christ. You're a new creation, Paul would say elsewhere. The Holy Spirit dwells in you. You have this mind. So I I get on one hand, right? We go, man, this seems impossible. And I agree. But on the other hand, Paul says, no, 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 no. You can do this. You've been given the mind of Jesus. You are able to do this. Even in Galatians 5, after Paul talks about, here's all the works of the flesh. He says this, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Paul says, if you are in Christ, you've, you've crucified the flesh. And you can actually walk in in the Spirit. You can do this. You have the mind of Christ. 
So then practically to, to close, how, how do we do this then? Right, I think, I think if, we can, if we can somehow do this, stop thinking about ourselves and think about your spouse. I, I am a firm believer that so much conflict and what we argue about will disappear. Not, not everything. So one, you need to remind yourself who you are in Christ often. You, you just have to remind, because this, this humbles you. When you ask, who is Jesus? What has he done? Who am I in light of that? This helps with your humility because then you're giving a proper estimation of yourself. My sin, my salvation, my need of grace and mercy and love that I fail and Jesus has to pick me back up. When you remind yourself of the gospel often, it humbles you and then you run to Jesus for your for, for forgiveness, and then you're more, more quickly to ask your spouse for forgiveness because then it's not a pride thing. You just, you're, you're walking in humility because you know who God is and you know who you are. So remind yourself often of who you are in Christ. Secondly, you must consciously decide to serve your spouse. It doesn't just happen. You've been given the mind of Christ. It's yours in Christ Jesus. You have the Spirit. But you have to make a, a conscious choice, I, I would say daily, to say, today I'm going to serve my spouse. Um, every Tuesday I meet with a group of guys at, at, at Silver Creek and we kind of talk through the sermon and, and unpack it and what was good and what was bad and and then we talk through what the next week's sermon is. And so this past Tuesday, I just asked them, so th these are all uh, a man's perspective, but I said, men, how do you do this? What are ways that you as men do exactly what Paul's saying? Give me, I said, give me some sermon material. <gasps> how do you do this? Because I just want to hear from other people. So here, here's some answers they gave. Talk to yourself and remind yourself why you love your spouse. Right, the, 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 the guy that shared that said that, you know, when I am, when I am frustrated with my spouse or I'm, we're dealing with something, he says, I, I consciously talk to myself and I remind myself all the reasons that I love my spouse. Ask your spouse what they enjoy doing. Intentionally make room for them. Find out what their passions and hobbies are and, and help them do those things. Being sensitive to how their day was, focusing on small things to help your spouse succeed. It was great. One guy said, listen, a once-a-year vacation to Hawaii is not going to fix a year of neglect. It doesn't. He said, asking my spouse about the small things every day. Making a, a conscious effort to focus on their love languages. How does my spouse receive love? Is it through quality time? Do, do they really come alive when, it's, when I write words of encouragement to, to them? When, when I serve them? When I do the dishes for them? Find out how does my, my spouse best receive love and then show love to them in that way. And I, I, I honestly believe it is a daily conscious decision. I remember... Um, this was a few years ago. Um, but you would have days at work, believe it or not, when you're dealing with people, none of you, other people, um, dealing with people and problems and things like that. And then I can remember there were many a day when I drove home, and it's, it was like two minutes away, but I would park in our driveway for a few minutes just praying, saying, okay, Lord, my flesh wants to go in and be served I want to lay on the couch. I want my wife to bring me a drink. I don't want to help with the kids because I worked hard today. And I had to daily, for a period of time, pray in the driveway, Jesus, I need help to serve my family. I want to go inside and I want to see how their day was. I want to get on the floor and play with my kids. I want to give my wife a break. I want to help clean but I said, Jesus, you have to help me. And there was many days where I failed. 
But there was many days where because the Holy Spirit dwells in me, I was able to go in and do just that. But it was a conscious decision. So consciously, daily, decide to serve your spouse. And then lastly, you must live in light of eternity. Marriage, it can seem long. You go, it's till I die. Whatever that is, whatever God gives you, 50, 60, 70 years, whatever it is, with one person serving them, sacrificing them. But can I just suggest to you that your life is a drop in the bucket compared to eternity. And so I would encourage you to evaluate arguments and disagreements in light of eternity. Because I've noticed, and this might not be true for you, but I've noticed 70 to 80% of our arguments are over really stupid things. Like I remember one of the, the biggest conflicts we had, and we're out of time, but that's okay. One of the biggest conflicts we had early on is actually the way that we were raised. My family, the way that we did things is that after dinner, we would all immediately clean up the kitchen, do the dishes, sweep, get everything, you know, nice and clean, and then you are allowed to go play. And Molly grew up the opposite. Molly's family was, yeah, we'll get around to it. The sun's going down. Let's go enjoy our day, and then we'll clean up afterwards. Believe it or not, that was some of the biggest conflicts we had. And, and you just, you, you have to get to a place where you go, really, at, at year 30,000 in eternity with Jesus, are we going to care when we clean the kitchen? No, it does not matter. And so we just said, we're not going to argue about this anymore. This is so dumb. And may, may I submit to you that so much of our conflict is over really silly things. But all it is is self-centeredness and selfishness going, my way is right. So listen, until the day you die, this will always be a battle, single or married. This will always be a battle because we have a sinful flesh that rears its, its ugly head. But can you imagine the kind of unity and harmony and the sanctuary that your home would be if both spouses just consciously every day said, you know what, I'm going to make a commitment today. I'm going to put aside my selfish ambition and my pride. I'm going to stop obsessing about myself and being right and getting my way. And I'm actually going to devote my life to serve my spouse. Like today, I want to outdo them in showing honor. I want to count my spouse as more significant than myself. I want to think not only to my own interests and my needs and my wants, but I want to daily decide, I'm going to think of you. It's possible. You have the mind of Christ. It is yours in Jesus. But it's a daily battle to actually live like this. So Father, I just thank you for your word yet again. And God, the truth is, all of us are so self-centered. I know from my own life, I'm just, I'm just constantly thinking about myself and putting my needs first and what do I want and what's my desire. And, and, and then I just assume that everyone else exists to, to serve me. We're just, all of us are so self-centered because of our flesh and our sinful nature. And yet, Jesus, you came and you died, and the Bible says that those who are in Christ, we've, we've crucified our flesh. And we're walking with the Spirit now. We have the mind of Christ. So, Jesus, would you help us in this? I just pray for married couples. And I know this is true because I see it in my own marriage. So much of our conflict and disagreement and the worst times that we go through, it's because both parties just want their own way. And both parties think that they're right. And both parties think that they're more important. So God, help us as husbands and wives to live with humility. To view our spouses as more important than us. To look not only to, to our own interests, but to the interests of our 
spouse. And I pray that, God, we would just get into a habit of daily reminding ourselves of the gospel. Who am I in light of what you have done, Jesus? And that that would humble us. And that daily we would make conscious decisions. Today, right, May 1st, Sunday, today, I am going to commit to serve my spouse. And even in, in the small things, God, that we would just constantly be thinking of them. Now, for those who are single, God, this passage still applies to them. I pray that our single people would, would consider other people as more important than themselves, whether it's in their friend group or at their work or at their school or in the young adults group here or in senior youth or whatever it is, God, but that as followers of Jesus, they would say, no, I'm not going to think about myself. I'm going to actually put other people's needs ahead of my own. So Jesus, help us in this. I thank you that when we fail, and we will, um, you are quick to forgive, and we can run to you and experience grace and mercy from you, but would you help us in this? I pray that you would strengthen our marriages as both husbands and wives put their spouse ahead of themselves. And help us even in small ways just to begin to take incremental steps to do this. And so I just pray all of this in your name, Jesus. Amen.